Good evening. Welcome. Tonight we're going to be discussing the history and geography of Haiti. But first I really want to quickly acknowledge all the likes and So Haiti has many different mountain ranges. Pierre is the Massif du Nord. The Noir Mountains, the Tel Range, the Massif de, Sel, de la Selle, excuse me, and the Massif de la Haute. And in between all these mountain ranges are valleys or plateaus, and all the major cities lie in these plateaus. I'll show you some pictures later from this book. Haiti has some gorgeous, gorgeous mountains. I can't wait to show you. Haiti also has um, the longest river in the Caribbean, the Artibonite River. It flows all down here to Lake Pelig. These are the mountains, so it flows out to the ocean. My bad. <laughs> Haiti also has a few islands that belong to it. Up here is Tortuga Island, which I didn't know much about when I started researching, but I was like, doesn't that have to do with pirates? Hmm. You'll see. Gonaf Island is the largest island below. Right here in the Gulf of Ganav, appropriately named. Down here is Vash Island. And then the Kayamite Ke Islands. It's a big Gran Kayamite. There's a little tiny, tiny one right there. And very interesting enough, here is Navasa Island. Now, there is a huge dispute about this island because it was officially given to Haiti way back in 1697, but the United States lays claim to this island. Even though nobody lives there, it's a natural reserve. It's controlled by the United States Fish and Wildlife Department. You can't go on this island without a special permit. You can only get on Puerto Rico. You can fly in for like a quick day trip to see the island. And you can't stay for night. There's nowhere to stay. There's no houses or anything. It's all natural, untouched land, but Haiti still claims it, so there's an ongoing dispute about this island, but the, the U.S. are very, very certain that they own and control this island. Legally, they do, but, you know, it's always been a part of Haiti for hundreds of years, so. There's another map in here of the major cities. Here, you can see that there's Lots and lots of different major cities, but the important ones that we're going to mention in the history are Cap Hacien up here, uh, which used to be called Cap Francais, 
you'll find out how it got changed. And of course, Port Au Prince, the capital there. Next to it is Special V, just named after one of the former presidents of Haiti. We'll talk about him too. But I really want to show you this map because I also want to show you the Dominican Republic, which is a very large part of Haiti's history. So it's, it's important to see it as well. So, the first thing I like to research when I'm learning about a new country is how did it get its name? How did it become Haiti? Or, as they say on the island, they pronounce it Haiti. Haiti. H is silent. Haiti. And it's because the native peoples on this island called it that long, long ago, hundreds of years ago. And they called it that for thousands of years. And it means land of the mountains. Because, of course, it's covered in mountains beautiful, beautiful mountain ranges. The people that used to live there were called the Taino Arawa people. They had a very sophisticated society with lots of different tribes and tribal leaders, customs, but works. They were very advanced for the time. I mean, they're about as advanced as any other culture around the world. They weren't technologically economically, socially advanced. It's a basically a country, honestly, divided up into different tribes. But sadly, their way of life drastically changed on December 6, 1492, when Christopher Columbus landed the north coast of the island. He called this land Hispaniola, which it's still called today. Technically, the entire island is called Hispaniola. Now, as we all know from elementary school, Christopher Columbus was from Italy and he wanted to sail west and no one in Italy would pay for his trip so he went to Spain and the Spanish royalty paid for him to carry three ships. He landed here so he named it Hispaniola and claimed it for Spain. Um, he set up the first Little village around here um, on December 25th and appropriately named it La Navidad. Then he sailed back to Spain, came back a few months later to check on the sailors that were living there at La Navidad, and they had all been killed by the Taino people. So we'll never really know exactly what happened to them, but we, we can assume what happened to them. Um, at first, the Taino people were somewhat friendly to Columbus and his crew and gave them like gold and things like that so Columbus assumed that the island was rich with gold so he of course saw these people as less than since they weren't Christian and they were brown obviously so you know can't be important or anything <laughs> it's, it's a common theme in this country's history so just if you have any issues with race it's not this is not the video for you um so he quickly enslaved the people and set them to work in the gold mines and established um plantations across the island since it was a great place to grow um sugar cane mostly and many many of those tribal people died in the cruelty of the slave labor not to mention the disease that they brought from Europe. The very first ever smallpox epidemic in the Americas, the Western Hemisphere, happened on Hispaniola in 1507. Now, of course, um, the tribal people weren't enough for, you know, the, the farming and mining that they wanted to do. Especially since they were dying off so quickly. So they started importing kidnapped African slaves that first started on the island in 1503. Um, they imported hundreds of thousands of kidnapped peoples from West Africa, uh, forced them to work in the plantations for sugarcane, um, coffee, tobacco, all sorts of different kinds of things. And the uh, Spanish really uh, focused their attention on this half of the island, 
which makes sense because make my pencil back. There we go. This half of the island. Because, you know, they're sailing from Spain and they mainly use this island um, as a docking point to refuel so they can continue sailing to Central and South America. And then, you know, easy to ship things back out if you're on this half of the island. So this half was very neglected. Um, it was still occupied by the Spanish, but not as you know, well-maintained as this half of the island. So this half sort of fell into disrepair, and that actually opened up the door for pirates. And pirates set up bases on Tortuga Pier and on Vash Island down here. And actually, if you know Captain Morgan, as in the rum, his base was on Vash Island. It also paved the way for the French to start slowly but surely creeping in on this half of the island to get in on the plantation business to grow sugarcane. And they also imported a lot of kidnapped Africans to work as slaves on their plantations. So, you know, the Spanish weren't very happy about the French coming in onto their island to work the industry. So, in 1697, they drafted the Treaty of Ryswick, and that divided the island between the Spanish and the French. Now, this divide isn't the same borders that we see today. Um, it was more closer to the coastline, so basically the French just had this peninsula, this peninsula, and all the little islands, and while the Spanish had everything else, basically. Uh, but everyone seemed happy with the arrangement. I think everyone got what they needed, and um, they renamed the island. Um, it was called Santo Domingo by the Spanish, so the French called their half San Domingue. Very apropos. Um, and it became a huge source of profit for France. They made lots and lots of money from the plantations on this island. Um, so it was a great asset for France. Um, however, you know, as time goes on, they, you know, brought in more and more slaves for their industry to the point where in the late 1700s, the slaves outnumbered the white people 10 to 1. There were hundreds of thousands of African slaves on the island and only like a couple, like maybe tens of thousands of um, white people, maybe a little less. Um, also at this time, America had a revolution that formed their own country in 1776, and then in 1789, France had their revolution, and the royal family was overthrown, the whole monarchy was thrown out, and France became a democracy. Well, at that time it was a democracy. Um, so, word of these revolutions, you know, traveled around the world, but it definitely reached saint -Domingue. and the people were a little inspired, especially the mulatto population, which is people who are half black, half white, who were sort of the middle class in the social structure of saint -Domingue. They were their own, you know, society with you know, slaves on the very bottom having pretty much no rights, and whites at the very top having as many rights as they want. Mulattoes were in the middle having some rights, uh, but, you know, not recognized as fully white, basically, but obviously weren't treated nearly as awful as the slaves were. So, um, it mainly stirred up thoughts in the mulatto population and, of course, in the slave population. So the revolutions inspired the colored community of Santo Domingo, and in August 1791, they started a slave revolt, a massive slave revolt. And their leader was named Toussaint Louverture, who was, um, he, he wasn't Creole, he was 100% black, but um, his father from Africa was the favorite of his master, and he wasn't treated like a field 
slave, you know, he um, did like the less intensive labor, like taking care of horses and things. Um, and his wife and children were very well treated and Toussaint was educated and had a lot of opportunities, even for, you know, someone who lived on Saint-Domingue. Um, so he was very intelligent, very smart, and a fantastic leader. And he basically led the slaves of Saint-Domingue to victory. France gave up, and in 1792 they uh, abolished slavery. So the black population of Saint-Domingue were free. And it was a great, great victory for them. So um, Toussaint Louverture became the leader of Saint-Domingue, and he was very adamant about keeping their ties with France. Um, most likely for economic reasons. Um, but a problem arose in the form of Napoleon Bonaparte, who very much needed money. Um, and he saw Saint-Domingue as dollar signs and thought, let's just take it back from them, you know? Um, so he sent his troops and, um, there was another great war against the French, um, which resulted in Toussaint Louverture being captured, and he died in prison in France. Um, so his friend, uh, Louverture had a, like, friend circle that you're, we're gonna hear all about them. Um, his friend de Céline took charge of the battle against the French. Now, de Céline was one of those slaves that was in the fields and was very brutally treated and very brutally beaten. So he really wanted revenge on white people in general. So he attacked the French with no mercy. Um, and on top of that, the French soldiers were all dying of yellow fever. So Napoleon eventually had to pull his troops back. And because of this loss, he sold the Louisiana territory to the United States because that's how desperate he was for money, especially after this huge loss. So if it wasn't for the black population of Saint-Domingue, we may not have America as we know it today. Very interesting. Um, Desalines became the new leader. He declared total independence for the country on January 1st, 1804, he proclaimed himself emperor for life, and he renamed the country to Haiti, um, which, like I said before, was the original ancestral name of the island. So he wanted to erase any kind of French connection. Um, Desaline also, sorry, Desaline also ordered a massacre of pretty much every white person in the country. Um, you're going to hear me say on this channel, this phrase, um, one way or another, which is my calming, relaxing way of saying some atrocities happened. So pretty much m most of the white population left Haiti one way or another. You know, there's no country. I've, I've been doing research of about 10 countries now and a lot more on the way. We have well over 200 to do. Um, and I have yet to find one that didn't have some sort of atrocious atrocity. So that's how we're going to refer to it on this channel. Um, Desaline's main problem was that um, he didn't have any economic connections. A lot of countries didn't recognize Haiti as a country, including the United States. Thomas Jefferson refused to acknowledge them, as did many congressmen and senators. Um, particularly the ones from the South, because they did not want their slaves to get any ideas. And actually, the United States didn't recognize Haiti until 1861, when all of the Southern senators and congressmen pulled out to form the Confederacy. So there is pretty much no one left in Washington, D.C. that was opposed to the idea of recognizing Haiti then. Um, but Desaline needed to get money somehow, and we, he had all these plantations, so he pretty much put everyone back to work and telling them, you know, they have wages now, they're working for their money, um, but you're still doing the same hard backbreaking work that you were doing before. And people weren't very happy about that. And um, Desaline's popularity plummeted, and he was assassinated on October 17th, 1806. 
So with Dessaline gone, there were two new candidates to take charge of the country who were also in Toussaint Louverture's friend circle, and their names were Henri Christophe and Alexandre Pession. Now, Henri Christophe had this fabulous idea of taking over the country and making it into a monarchy, like a European-style monarchy. Um, Pession wasn't so crazy about that idea. So the country actually wound up getting divided in half about here. So this whole northern part became the Kingdom of Haiti, with King Henry I, as he called himself, in charge here at Cap Haussien, which he renamed from, it was called Cap Francais. And Pession ruled this half of the island as just the Republic of Haiti. He ruled it as a democracy. He was the president. Um, and the uh, main difference between the two countries, there was a lot, but the, um, the biggest one was that the kingdom was more for black people and the republic was more for the mulatto class of people. Um, two different cultures, basically, at that time. Um, also, King Henri Christophe ran his side of the country very much like old school European style, where basically everyone was pretty much like a serf working the plantations while he lived in luxury. He built like a huge palace for himself called Sans Souci, which means no worries in French, where he would hold like lavish balls and parties. He also built a huge, huge um, citadel, I guess, called Citadel La Ferrière, which um, you're going to see a picture of in this book I'm going to show you. But um, today, Citadel of Ferrier is a, World Heritage site, a UNESCO World Heritage Site, and I am going to do a series on every World Heritage Site in the world. Sorry, the cat's licking my hand. Um, but Haiti, here we go. Haiti only has the one site, so the next country we're going to do next week has three, and I think the one after that has three, maybe four. So um, after we get a bunch, I'll do a big video of them. So you will find out more about Citadel of Ferrier in a more relaxed, whispered detail in a few weeks. But um, good times couldn't last for Henri Christophe. Um, the people weren't happy with him at all for very obvious reasons. He discovered a plot to assassinate him, so he took his own life. Um, the president down here, because they had elections, was named um, Jean-Pierre Boyer, and um, also a friend of Dussel Overture. Um, he was elected president, this country fell apart, so he absorbed it back and made the country whole as a Republic of Haiti again. He reunited the country in 1821. And then he had the idea of just taking over the entire island and making the whole island Haiti. This was still all owned by Spain. And he did. He invaded very cruelly and took over the island and renamed the entire island Haiti and made it all his country. I do like the idea of the whole island being united, but not in that method. It's not the best way to go about things. I don't know why they couldn't just talk it out but it's very complicated. Um, in 1825, France came knocking. They still wanted that money. You know, they knew that this was such a huge profit for them back then. They wanted money desperately. So they pretty much told Boyer, like, we are coming to conquer you. And Boyer was like, no. So they worked out an agreement where France would recognize Haiti as an independent nation if they paid them back, basically, reparations for all the money that they had lost since the slave revolt. And that came out to 150 million francs, which today's terms would probably be like a couple billion dollars, like maybe three or four billion dollars. Um, not a very good deal for a very poor country. Um, I wouldn't have taken it, but, you know, it stopped war, right? So now Haiti was very much in debt to France, and um, the country suffered greatly because of this debt. Um, 
the, the government basically borrowed money from other countries and then racked up more debt to try to pay that off, and um, they actually did not get it paid off until 1947. It took that long. Um, in 1844, the Dominicans rose up against the Haitians and retook their land. Um, the leader at the time of Haiti was named Piero. He uh, fought them back but failed, and because of that, he was overthrown in a coup d'etat. Now, speaking of which, there were many, 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 many coup d'etats in Haiti. I want to say there were 23, 20, something like between 23 and 28. Not kidding. The last technical coup d'etat was in 2004. So, like, pretty much since Dessaline was assassinated until modern times, the government has constantly been overthrown, taken over. A few years later, that government gets overthrown, taken over, on repeat for centuries, like, <laughs> for hundreds of years. Um, it was very unstable, um, and that really had to do with the economy being so bad because they owed that massive debt to France. And, um, they just couldn't really find a lot of people to trade with, you know, because no one at that time wanted to recognize Haiti because they didn't want to acknowledge that slaves should be freed, basically. Um, time slowly changed, obviously, but that was the situation at the time. Um, meanwhile, in 1849, France actually recognized the Dominican Republic as its own independent nation. That's what they renamed the country to once they um, declared independence from Haiti. And um, Haiti was not happy about this. So they tried to invade again. The leader at that time was named Faustin Sobluk, um, or as he called himself, Emperor Faustin I. A lot of people declared themselves leaders for life in the history of Haiti. Um, he actually was leading a very successful take back of the country, but um, troubles arose in the capital, Port-au-Prince, and he knew that, you know, as he was working his way through the Dominican Republic, that if he did not fix things at home, there wouldn't be a home to come back to, so he turned around to settle matters in Port-au-Prince, and the Dominicans took that opportunity to fight back, and they kept their independence, and then Faustin was overthrown in a coup d'etat because of that horrible loss. On repeat, on repeat, literally, <laughs> for decades and decades. It was quite a, quite a mess, politically. Very unstable place to live, politically. Um, just imagine constant coups on repeat literally until the 1990s, 2000s. But let's jump to 1914, when um, Germans started moving into Haiti, and Americans took notice of this because it's 1914. World War I is, you know, raging on. America just completed building the Panama Canal down in Panama, and they owned it. Um, and they were very worried about the Germans trying to take over the Panama Canal and thought, well, if, you know, they're moving into Haiti where they just had another coup d'etat, the government was very unstable, it would be a very easy nation for the Germans to overthrow. So they're very worried about that. So in 1915, the United States sent Marines into Haiti and they basically, um, occupied the country. They took it over by force, pretty much. And they installed a pro-U.S. president to run things. And, um, the U.S. Marines stayed in Haiti until 1934. It's th officially the longest occupation in United States history. Now, some very good things came of this occupation. They revamped the entire government system. So it ran more like the United States in terms of setting up like things like a Supreme Court, um, you know, establishing a better constitution, things like that. They also built roads. You can see all the roads on this map. Those were all put in by the Americans. So they greatly improved the infrastructure of Haiti. However, um, 
it was also a very, very bad time because a lot of Haitians fought back against the American soldiers and they were not very successful at all. The United States claims that they killed about two, three thousand ish Haitians during the occupation, but Haiti claims it's more around 15,000 Haitians at that time. So, um, does the good outweigh the bad? Does the bad overshadow the good? Up for debate, but, um, you know, it's what America likes to do. They like to interfere as dramatically as possible. We'll see that in a lot of countries around the world. Um, uh, during World War II, Haiti fought with the Allies, most likely because America's right there, breathing down their necks, so a wise decision to do. Um, I also don't think they had any investment in, you know, supporting the other side, so. Actually, they even, um, took in Jewish refugees, so, and there's still a small Jewish population in Haiti today because of that. Um, so a democracy was struggling in Haiti, doing its best, and um, after a few um, corrupt elections, they worked things out and eventually elected in 1957 a man named Dr. Francois Duvalier, and he was an actual doctor, medical doctor, and they called him Papa Doc, which sounds very cute and charming, <laughs> but he was not, he was not at all cute and charming, believe me. Uh, he was a very cruel dictator. He declared himself leader for life, as, you know, a lot of leaders had done in Haiti. And he set up his own militia called the Tonton Makout, which is a word for the boogeyman. And um, they basically just roamed the streets, open carrying guns and weapons, and had free reign to kill whoever they even suspected was anti-Duvalier. So, um, many, many people lost their lives at this time. Um, it was a very, very cruel, um, takeover of the country. And, um, he was not overthrown because he had financial support from the United States because at the end of the day, he was extremely anti-communist and the United States wanted a leader in this region who was anti-communist because, I mean, look who's right next door, right? So, um, you know, Duvalier had all the support of the most powerful nation in the world. So he ruled until he died, and his son took over in 1971. His name was Jean-Claude Duvalier, and they called him Baby Talk, which again sounds very cute and fun, but he was not. <laughs> he, um, he kept a lot of his father's policies, but didn't enforce them as strong. You know, he, he wanted to rule strong, but not really rule by fear. Which, as it turns out, that fear was keeping the locals in line. And, um, they overthrew him and he was exiled out of Haiti in 1986. Um, and then they were setting up elections again. And their, uh, next president was named Aristide, elected in 1990. Um, just a side note, um, in America, we have presidents that can have two terms in a row. They can run, um, get elected for four years, and then they can run again for another four years, so they can stay in power for eight total years. In Haiti, they're only allowed one term at a time, and each term is five years. So Aristide was president in 1990, um, and then the next election was in 95, so he couldn't run then. But um, he was actually overthrown in a coup d'etat in 1991. Aristide was pretty pro-U.S. Um, and the United States wanted to keep him in power. So they, um, managed to reinstate him in 1994. They invaded once again, took over the government, and put Aristide back in power. But when the 95 elections rolled around, he couldn't run again. So he had to sit out five years but he spent that five years creating a new political party and building momentum. So he got reelected in 2000. Um, and according to him and his wife, he was exiled from the country by the United States in um, like an incognito um, coup d'etat, basically. 
but the United States denies that completely, so we'll never know the true story. But um, as of now, the um, some elections have been a little questionable, but since then there have not been any overthrows. There have been protests, there's been demonstrations, but that's really common in a lot of countries nowadays. Um, so th since then, there hasn't been any massive overthrows of the government. Um, Haiti was slowly working its way up economically in the 2000s. Um, they were hit by a tropical storm in 2004, but the real disaster came in 2008. On one hand, the recession was happening, and it hit Haiti very, very hard. All of their prices on essentials skyrocketed, and um, there were huge protests and, you know, calls to force the president out of office, and he lowered the prices, which is not really the answer during a recession. It's like printing more money is not a solution. Um, but then, in 2008, Haiti was hit by three hurricanes and a tropical storm killed um, tens of thousands of people, displaced even more, caused massive mudslides um, from, I'll show you in this book, the deforestation that has been happening around Haiti to create more farmland, um, and it devastated the country. And as they were struggling to recover from that, on January 12th, 2010, Port-au-Prince was hit with a 7.0 earthquake, which devastated the country on a whole other level. You know, Haiti was not prepared for massive earthquakes like that. Um, many, 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 pretty much all the buildings in Haiti were destroyed. Uh, the total death count was 316,000, but there were also millions of people who became ill due to disease, um, running rampant, the uh, river was contaminated, and many people became sick from that. Um, and then, of course, millions were homeless, displaced. And um, it took many years to make anything even seem slightly normal like it was before. And to this day, Haiti is still recovering from that event, even though it was 10 years ago. So, I wish I had a happier ending for you, but that is where Haiti sits today. That was a brief history of Haiti. Let me show you some of this book. Just do a quick flip through. Show you some important pictures. Let's see. Oh, here comes Columbus. I think every school child in America knows the names of the ships. Um, here's a sugar plantation. You can see the slaves there working hard. Now, here's what I was talking about with the deforestation. So, as you can see, um, this hillside, look at these mountains back here, I told you they're beautiful. So, you can see how they dug into this hillside to create um, farm tracks, right? Places to grow crops. Um, which, at first, is a good idea, but it erodes the topsoil. So, every crop that's replanted will never grow back as strong. Not to mention, you have to cut down a lot of trees to create this. So this is what contributed to a lot of mudslides and um, more devastation from rains and natural disasters. So um, there is a movement to replace the trees that have been lost. Look at this. Look how gorgeous the mists, the mountains back here. It's so beautiful. And then look at this. This is a pirate fortress on Tortuga, built by Jean Le Vasseur in the 17th century. This is the RT Bonite River, and this is a dam in that river. It's another gorgeous beach. Beautiful, beautiful. There was a big tourist movement in the 1950s, um, but Duvalier pretty much ended all of that and the tourism industry has been slowly trying to rebuild itself in Haiti. Um, this is damage from the hurricane in 2008, and this is damage from the earthquake in 2010. This is Port-au-Prince. You can see devastation. Here's some more. 
my library had a 2009 edition of this book, so I made extra sure to make sure I got the later edition because the earthquake is such a huge, huge part of their history, their modern history. The National Bird, the Hispaniola and Trocon. This is a shiny green wings, a red belly, a gray throat and breast, and a dark blue tail with white markings. It's very pretty. It goes here. A big old crocodile. Jump, 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 jump. Do you know the difference between, well, a crocodile and alligator? Like the main physical difference is that crocodiles have these long, pointy snouts and alligators have short, round ones. Not that that matters when they're coming at you. <laughs> Look at these boys. They're like, why are you taking our picture? We're just out with our guns. This is a hutia. Have you ever heard of a hutia? It's a rodent. It's very cute. And apparently this and the Haitian Solenodon are the only two mammals that live on Hispaniola. Here's Columbus landing on the island. And here's another picture of a sugar plantation. You can see all the sugar canes. You can see where La Navidad was. And this was San Domingo. And this was Santo Domingo. dark time in the history of the world. Oh, this is a great picture. Look at this. Bring it closer. Look at this white lady in her carriage being pulled by her slaves. And then look at this slave right here. It's what a juxtaposition. Obviously, you know where this kind of behavior leads to revolution and revolt. This is a depiction of the first battle on August 21st, 1791. Here's another battle in Cap Francais, burning the city. There's Napoleon. Surprise Napoleon. And this is Toussaint Louverture, who's considered one of probably the biggest hero in Haitian history. Here's Dessaline riding a bright red horse with like a raccoon tail. I don't know. Um, you know, at the end of the day, Dessaline is a beloved figure. Um, the national anthem's named after him, and um, he was the one to make Haiti an independent nation. Um, yeah, I mean, there was a lot of horrific things he did, but at the end of the day, he did create Haiti. Oh, here's a good map of the two Haiti. So here's the Kingdom of Haiti, the Capacian, and here's the Republic of Haiti, Port-au-Prince. Everything else belonged to Spain. And here's the Citadel of Ferrier. Look how gorgeous this is. What a sight. After Henri Christophe died, it was abandoned, and um, nature took over parts of it. It's be so cool to see. Oh, here he is. Henri Christophe. He saw himself as a very fancy European style. He's got the tri corner hat that was so in style back then in France. Um, this is a cool picture from Port au Prince in 1901. Look at the styles. So the Americans marching in in 1915. And this is Charlemagne Perrault right here. And he was a very, um, prominent figure in the anti-American invasion movement. And the Americans actually killed him and paraded his body around to just kind of show, you know, don't mess with us. But it just led to more revolt and upset, very obviously. This is Francois de Valier, Papa Doc. Oh, and here's a picture of the, um, Tantan Macoute. They had a very signature style, a uniform that they all wore. They all wore the glasses and the hats. Um, and you can see the guns that he's carrying. Very frightening, honestly. 
This is Jean-Bertrand Aristide, uh, who actually started off as a Catholic priest, and he very much believed that the church should not just be a religious center, but a um, social education center. You know, it should be a place for the community to gather. It should be a place for children to come and learn and, you know, educate themselves. And so he was very beloved to a lot of the country folk. And that's how he got elected. But, um, you know, once you rise to the top, the uh, temptation lies there. I'll just leave it at that. Here's the um, presidential palace after the earthquake. Very destroyed. Here's the Haitian flag. It has a very interesting story. So the flag was designed well, partially by Dessalines, who took the French flag, which is blue, white, and red, and he cut out the white part. And then his goddaughter named Catherine Flan sewed the two pieces together and made the Haitian flag. And then the Haitian coat of arms sits in the middle of the flag. Here you can see a tent city um, in Port-au-Prince set up after the earthquake. And here's some workers trying to clear up some rubble from the earthquake. Let's see. Oh, here we go. So this is a picture of the currency of Haiti. They're called gourds. And on the 10 gourd bill, is Sanit Belair. And Sanit Belair, she, was a woman, obviously, uh, she fought against Napoleon's forces, the invasion. She was a very prominent war hero at the time. It's not often you have female war heroes. Oh. He's set, doesn't he? He's very proud of his wares there. He's got everything you need. <laughs> oh, so this is a tap tap. As you can see, it's not really a bus in the traditional sense. This is a truck, right? Um, there's also a lot of vans and things like that that are set up as tap tap buses, but they're all very, very colorful. And they have inspirational slogans written on them. And um, they're called tap tap buses because to get off, you tap tap to let the driver know that you want to. I'm very happy to be there. Let's see. And another good picture for you. Oh, here we go. I want to talk about this chapter. So this is a picture from a Day of the Dead celebration. It's wearing fantastic outfits. They paint their faces white. And uh, she's straight up holding a bone. It's just straight up bone. So, um, here we go. Um, Catholicism is a major part of Haitian life. Almost all Haitians are Catholic. Um, but there is still the culture of voodoo, which is a belief that was brought over from Africa. And has, um sort of integrated among all of the slave populations, the traditions have stayed alive. And um, many people still practice the voodoo traditions and customs today. Here's a picture of a ritual down here, apparently. This is a priestess called a mamba, doing a ritual. Um, and here's a male priest, a hoongan. So yeah, voodoo is still very much a part of daily life. It's not graphic, it's just... I'd rather not. Um, look at this picture, though. Wouldn't you want to be here? This is a party. They look great. <laughs> Set that down. Oh, here's a beautiful picture of Louis Vuitton. These are rah-rah dancers, and it's a part of their carnival traditions. This is amazing. I'm obsessed. That's so cool. I 
Fitch Tantacott, very famous author from Haiti. Beautiful artwork. Soccer is a huge part of daily life in Haiti. Many, many countries um, have soccer as their number one sport. Haiti's no exception. This is, um, oh sorry. <laughs> This is um, Joe Gatchon, I believe his name's pronounced. Um, and he was a very famous soccer player from Haiti who was kidnapped by the Tonton Makut from um, Duvalier's regime. And he was vanished. Cessation who vanished. And they later admitted that um, he did die. There's another tap tap. life. He's happy to be there. Excited to learn. Look at the buses. Here's a picture of a shanty town, which are plentiful in Haiti, sadly. This is the biggest shanty town in Haiti. It's in Port-au-Prince, and it's called Cité Soleil. No running water, no sanitation. video to leave a like and comment if you did. I hope you learned something cool today about Haiti. And I hope this was relaxing for you. I hope you unwind at the end of the day and maybe even help you sleep.